And welcome to this edition of the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast. Jordan Levine is back again. We're going to talk Dave Gettleman's Giants tenure. Jordan, happy to be back on? Of course. It's been too long. It's been too long. Happy to be back as always. All right. So I originally did this on the dock, like salary cuts, and I did it by category, but I'm going to go by year because obviously that is the best way to do it. So obviously Gettleman was hired in 2018. 2017 kind of ish because he was hired towards the end of the season, but 2018 was his first full year. His first move was cutting Bobby Hart, but that wasn't necessarily the biggest move. Um, Right away before the draft was obviously free agency, but before that the giants made some salary cuts. So, and this was the biggest class of salary cuts that the giants made just to open up some cap space. So all of them, I find pretty uh, reasonable cap cuts. Uh, Dominic Rogers Camardi did not want to take a pay cut, so the Giants saved $6.5 million, uh, in cap by cutting him. Brad Wing saved $1 million by cutting him. Had a horrible season along with the special teams unit in 2017. Dwayne Harris, a couple weeks later, saved about $2.45 million with that cut. And Brandon Marshall saved about $5.2 million with that cut. That was actually in April. But Um, Let's go to who they actually didn't keep in free agency from the Reese era. Devon Kennard is one of those guys, and he is now, I believe, with the Arizona Cardinals. But in 2018, he actually did have a good season with the Detroit Lions. And I'll get to it probably in a little bit because it has to deal with Romeo Quara. But the pass rush was lacking, obviously, in 2018. And the problem with that is, is that, you know, they brought in Arizona guys for Betcher. And what happened was they didn't produce like the Giants thought they would. And what happened was, is they should have kept maybe Devon Kennard or someone else uh, to ensure the pass rush. Obviously, we were, I think, dead last in sacks or next to dead last in sacks in 2018. Then you have Justin Pugh and Weston Richburg, both Jerry Reese draft picks. Both were good players, but they didn't pan out, so I do agree with those. Same with Orleans Darqua. He wasn't a draft pick necessarily, but he was the number one back towards the end of the 2017 season. And unfortunately, the Giants had the mindset of drafting Saquon Barkley, so he was no longer a part of the team. Ross Cockrell, I didn't agree with. Well, now I don't agree with it because I look at it from a bigger picture. He had Eli Apple on the roster. I don't think Ross Cockrell would have cost much more than maybe some of the other guys on the market. Janoris Jenkins, Apple, and Cockrell, if Apple may have panned out and they traded Apple later in the season, um, definitely Cockrell would have worked out. And he actually almost came back to the Giants this year, but unfortunately something didn't work out there. DJ Fluker, compared to his replacement being Patrick Omame, they should have kept him at a cheaper price. And they signed, I think it was Omame to a three-year $15 $15 million contract or a three-year $21 million contract. And I'm going to say it's about 15 mil. Um, but Omame didn't perform like they thought he would, and it was an overpay. So, unfortunately, things went the way they went. Uh, any feedback? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was actually thinking about the whole Patrick Omame situation. He kind of ties into the whole Nate Solder situation as well. Um, another guy they overpaid who ne- never really produced. Um, and I think that that all, all stems from the whole Andrew uh, Norwell well, well. fiasco, who Gettleman, uh, you know, he made him in Carolina. He, came, he had him when he was GM back there when he took Carolina to the Super Bowl. Um, Norwell was a guy that was undrafted and developed into a really nice player at one point. I think he was even the highest paid. He might still be the highest paid uh, interior lineman in the league. Um, and I think that the Giants, he was a guy the Giants were really set on. He was everyone's number one free agent uh, target. And I think the Giants kind of got cold feet after he didn't come. And then it led to a couple forces because Gettleman is a guy, we know he likes his hog mollies and he really wanted to shore up the offensive line for the future. Um, obviously he has done so, but it took a couple of years because of those bad signings. Yeah, and I think Gettleman knew quickly, probably after 2018, that, you know, in this day of sports, really, also football, baseball, whatever, is that you don't build teams through free agency anymore. You build them through the draft, and Gettleman is good at drafting. I mean, obviously, we'll get to the class, but 
uh, you are right on point with the whole Andrew Norwell thing. You know, he was in Carolina and the Giants may not have drafted Will Hernandez if Norwell did not come to the Giants, or I should say if Norwell didn't go to the Jaguars, uh, Patrick Omame, obviously. So break into it here. Here are the main signings of the free agency 2018 class, which probably would be his so-called far worst, most overpays, right. um, most players that really deserve their contracts. Nate Solder, four years, $62 million. Everyone, and you know, there's a lot of giant fans, content creators, whoever out there that will criticize the move. And a lot of people, though, were happy about it because what is your alternative at left tackle? You have Eric Flowers another year. And they didn't go in and draft the left tackle. I'm pretty sure they didn't really have any eyes on a left tackle. Um, but Nate Solder obviously was the move after Andrew Norwell went to Jacksonville. And then you have Patrick Omame, three years, $15 million. Kareem Martin, the same. Patrick Omame obviously was benched in week seven. Then Jamon Brown came in and Patrick Omame was cut. I think they incurred a lot of dead cap money with that one. So that wasn't a good move. Kareem Martin... Uh, I've criticized this move so many times. It has to be one of the least favorite moves of the Gettleman tenure for me. Uh, they brought him over because of the Arizona thing. Uh, three years, $15 million, as I mentioned. And it's not like he was a good player, in my opinion. Uh, he had seven and a half or six and a half total sacks in his whole career in Arizona. And from, that's from 2014 to 2017. And apparently James Betcher liked him a lot. And, you know, people were trying to defend the move, you know, uh, this guy's, you know, Arizona guy. But it's not like you're taking um, Chandler Jones and Patrick Peterson, putting them on the Giants. You're taking scraps, just like Josh Morrow, who was another signing. I didn't really have a problem with Morrow, but Kareem Martin, obviously it was higher pay, uh, some other low-risk signings. But a lot of people overreact, but again, it, it's like low money, and they were put into the situation they were because of depth reasons, because of talent reasons. Uh, Michael Thomas was a good signing for two years. They didn't sign two years, but they re-signed him in 2019. Good special teams guy. Uh, recorded, I believe, two interceptions on the season in, in 2018. Cody Latimer, good on kickoff returns and a good wide receiver on occasion downfield. Curtis Riley, um, James Betcher actually converted him into a safety, which was probably – and most definitely a bad, bad move. I was going to say, I don't think he was that bad, honestly. He he showed flashes back then. I mean, towards the ends of seasons, obviously the whole thing didn't work out. But I remember watching Curtis, and I didn't think he was such a bad player, actually. I actually disagree, disagree with that because there was a lot of plays that he took bad angles to tackling. Um, the one key play that I do remember when it came to bad angles, and I get he was only two two regular season games into the free safety position, was that long deep ball that Janoris Jenkins got beat on by Tavon Austin and I, Curtis I, Riley wasn't there. I, you know what? I have to interrupt. I honestly, I, I misspoke there. I don't think that he was a good player. I just think that of the Betcher system, which I did not like at all, I don't think that he was the glaring mistake. Or the glaring, no, absolutely. you know, like that, that, like, not that he was a good player, but I didn't, I didn't look at those games and say we lost because of Curtis Riley. I, I thought I lost, I thought we lost because we didn't have any pass rush or. It was a lot to that. And it deals with the whole 2018 right. season. And um, same thing with BW Webb. He was the starting second corner once Eli Apple got traded. And that's where I said, you know, bring in Ross Cockrell. I mean, he was not a free agent at the time. He had a season ending injury with Carolina. But keep Ross Cockrell in that situation because it's good corner depth, even though he's mostly sometimes a slot corner. But, you know, people are saying, oh, B.W. Webb is a bad player, Curtis Riley. Agreed, but I think on there I would have to really knock on Dave Gettleman and John Mara for the talent because that year the Giants, if you even look at the roster, they were not, you know, set up to win. If you look at the players – um, that they had starting at key positions. Curtis Riley, free safety. I mean, that was an experiment that didn't work. Um, obviously, Landon Collins, you know, on the defense, Janoris Jenkins. You didn't have a key pass rush. All the guys were scraps from Arizona. Uh, obviously, Barkley, you know, that's a win-now move. Eric Flowers and Patrick Omame on the right side of the offensive line. And I really wanted to rebuild, but a lot of people were in for the Saquon pick, which we'll get into in a minute, and obviously the whole entire draft class. But 
they really should have rebuilt there. And I'm not going to, you know, sit here and cry about it, but it's the truth. But right now we are heading on a good direction. So let's talk about the draft class from that year. I have like six papers here. Um, Saquon Barkley, obviously the first one. Originally, I did not want Saquon. I wanted to rebuild, move on from Eli. And people were telling me all around, even Penn State fans, you know, get Saquon Barkley. You know, there could be a quarterback in next year's draft. There was. Um, but Saquon Barkley, to me, listen, flashy player, generational talent, not for the Giants. That's at least how I saw it in 2018. Um, we needed to rebuild. We didn't have the cap space nor the talent to sit there and say that we're a winning team. Uh, Will Hernandez, unfortunately, he's fallen out of favor, at least from what we can see from the Joe Judge coaching staff, because he was a different coaching staff. You know, that was a different time. Now Shane Lemieux looks to be that left guard. But I liked Will. In his first year, rookie year, he did play well. Um, I think he's going to average out to be a solid average 16-game starter guard. Lorenzo Carter, the jury is still out on him. Uh, first year, you know, showed flashes. Second year, not the greatest. Third year, obviously got hurt. So we'll see what happens in 2021. Could be his last chance to probably say um, for the Giants. B.J. Hill, rotational defensive, ta defensive tackle at this point. Uh, one of the picks, the next pick also coming from the JPP trade, which actually I forgot to mention, but also going to the trades next, uh, which is kind of a little backwards, but who cares at this point. Kyle Oletta, I honestly felt obviously as part of the rebuilding you know, kind of view that a, why would you pick a quarterback there? That's a developmental project and B, why don't you select a position like a corner, like a needy position, maybe a tackle position that you could work on for the next couple of years. Maybe that person or player comes a starter. Uh, RJ McIntosh, he did not, you know, get activated at all this season. He was inactive for all 16 games. So he's just a rotational defensive tackle. I mean, he will have probably a bigger role, if Williams or Tomlinson doesn't stay and Sam Beal third round supplemental draft, he's probably not coming back this year after he opted out and only played six games of his career. Uh, what do you have to say on the draft picks and the free agent class? Um, as far as the draft picks go, I think that if they, they started out where we're now, this was what year three for this, for the inaugural draft class of Dave Gettleman's giants GM mm -hmm. tenure. Right. So I think through th three years, I think all these guys kind of took the same route. And I think a lot of it has to do with the coaching changes. Um, obviously through one year in the Shermer system or two years, whatever it was, uh, these guys all looked pretty good, right? Well, Hernandez was more than promising. He was looking like one of the steals of the draft um, as well as BJ Hill. A lot of guys thought BJ Hill was one of them. I remember that he was quoted to be one of the most NFL ready rookies that the giants had ever seen. Um, now I do think that things go into that uh, like, a, let's say right now, BJ Hill looks like a rotational guy, but that could just be due to, you know, you're trading a third and fifth rounder for Leonard Williams and you're not going to bench Dexter Lawrence or Dalvin Tomlinson for BJ Hill. But, you know, should we lose Dalvin or, or Leonard Williams? And it's looking likely that we're going to lose at least one of them uh, this off season. BJ Hill could actually become a very nice player for us. He's a guy that can easily step up and fill one of those roles. Um, the other polarizing player I wanted to talk about from that draft class is Lorenzo Carter because Lorenzo Carter this was supposed to be his year you know he was supposed to be the pass rusher the Giants wanted and need I mean obviously it doesn't mean much if you look at the blue and white scrimmage game that took place over the summer I think he had what like three three four sacks in, in, yeah. in that game he had a big I game. mean he was just he was looking impressive and he started off the year pretty good listen he wasn't rolling up the racking up the sacks but it Pressures, pressures matter, you know, you know pressures matter a lot, especially in the type of defense that the Giants play with filling it from the back to the front, New England style. Pressure matters a lot. You need to put pressure on the quarterback. If you're not sacking him, even if you're a throwaway, still a throwaway, you know what I mean? An incomplete pass, still an incomplete pass. So I do think that Lorenzo Carter had a lot of potential. And then just to tear your Achilles, I mean, it's just, it's a heartbreaker for Giants fans and for Lorenzo Carter. I really hope that he still has that explosive step that he had to him because this could be the year for, for Lorenzo Carter to prove himself. I mean, we, we don't need him to be a 10 plus sack guy. We still have Leonard Williams. Obviously most Giants fans are, you have to assume he's the number one priority of, of the free agent class. If Lorenzo Carter can come back and rack up six, seven, eight sacks on the season, he could be a, like the missing piece that the defensive line needs. Especially in creating terms 
of pressure. Let's go to the trades, and obviously we'll discuss the pass rush later on. Alec Ogletree. Now, I didn't, you know, I wasn't in depth as I am now. I was just like a football fan back then when this happened. But when we received Alec Ogletree, I was sort of happy because obviously, um, except for the fact, as I said, I wasn't necessarily, you know, I didn't know the Rams like I do now or at least no football. But I was, you know, sort of happy for the trade. But it ended up being not a good one. Spent two years with the Giants. He was carrying on a big cap hit. Um, Though he recorded five interceptions in 2018, wasn't much. I mean, obviously interceptions count. But again, uh, when you're not covering well, you're not tackling well, it just doesn't play out. And Ogletree probably has to be the biggest bust in terms of trading when it comes to Dave Gettleman. Uh, When we look at the trade, John Franklin Myers and John Kelly came out of the draft picks that we sent the Rams. Um, Kelly, I don't think is with the team anymore. Franklin Myers is actually with the Jets. Uh, we was, we selected Chris Slayton with the pick. It was obviously seventh round, so you're not going to get high value with Ogletree. Uh, but looks like both sides didn't really win the trade. But the biggest losers, if you have to pick the biggest loser, is the Giants right there. Uh, how did you think he played, and what's your like overall analysis on that? I. Uh, I don't think it was honestly. I think you you said it was the biggest, the worst trade of the Gettleman tenure. I mean, I think it was a bad trade. I think part of the reason why I don't feel like it was, I, I don't think it was a good trade by any means. Alec Ogletree was bad, and the Giants definitely took the worst hit of the two. But the fact that the Rams didn't really gain much out of it kind of soothes the pain as well. And I'd also go as far to say that it wasn't the worst trade, in my opinion, honestly. I think the the worst trade probably was trading back up into the first to get that, that third first round pick and take DeAndre Baker, who obviously didn't pan out. I mean, you couldn't predict that. You, you can't predict – you can predict, I mean, character. Like, you, you can see a guy's character, yeah. but you can't, predict, you can't predict an armed robbery, you know? So, I mean, that was a pretty bad trade. In the end, yeah. Um, also, Riley Dixon – which ended up, I think, being a good trade for us, even though this year he might be a cap cut candidate. He carries, I think, a, I don't know, 2.6. We saved 2.6 million from his cap cut. He didn't do well this year, at least, you know, towards the end of the season, that whole return unit um, defensively wasn't good. Um, obviously, it started, in my opinion, with the Bengals game where he gave up that huge kickoff return touchdown then later in the game before the defense actually bails you out you have that long return by Alex Erickson and I just think that Dixon had probably had his worst giant season I feel like that there's a lot of you know punters that you get cheap on the market you could also draft a punter but um I think Dixon you know had two good years in New York one bad and you know if the Giants choose to cut him I wouldn't be mad the next one deals with what we saw yesterday Jason Pierre-Paul, we traded the, uh, I think, 102nd overall pick in Jason Pierre-Paul and received the B.J. Hill pick and the Kyle Lalletta pick, I think, definitely. And obviously, it was a salary dump a little bit, but we definitely, in terms of that, lost that trade. Um, In terms of that, pass rush, obviously, trading him away was bad. And as I said, I'm not going to harp on a lot of these things. I'm not going to cry about it, but it is what it is. Uh, he's going to be facing his former, actually, no, hey, yeah, former defensive coordinator on Super Bowl Sunday. And he's going to be, you know, on the same team as Tom Brady getting a chance to win a ring. So that's another one that obviously wasn't the greatest. But, you know, we probably wouldn't have made a lot of moves if it wasn't for that trade because it did load off some salary. And the first year he was there, he had 12 uh, and a half sacks. And then I think he had the same or similar this year but he was really regressing towards the end of his Giants tenure. The next one is Brett Jones. And I'm going to get into this with the preseason cuts because it does remark a little bit. Brett Jones, uh, it was like, you know, not a total like bad move. You know, it's not, you know, the headline move when you're talking about Gettleman, but they traded him. He was the starting center uh, from the 2017 season. The Giants received a seventh round pick used to select Georgia Safo with Jay and, Brett Jones is a rotational, well, not really rotational, but a backup guard, backup setter for the Minnesota Vikings. Now, when it comes to released after the preseason, I'm not going to say, you know, everyone, but Romeo Quara definitely pushes Giants buttons when we're talking about him because he made 
other than 2019, a tremendous impact on that Detroit defense. He had nine and a half sacks this year, actually 10. Um, he's going to be hitting the free agent market. So the Giants, you know, as a cheap option, they invest in him. But he was one of the guys that I was pissed off about that they cut. And as I said, you can bring over guys from Arizona and you could say, you know, they're good or they fit the scheme or whatever. And you could say, oh, we're releasing this guy. We're not bringing this guy back because he doesn't fit. You know, that's fine and all well. But when they produce elsewhere and what you bring in doesn't produce, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be looked off on. Uh, some other guys that were cut after the preseason, Hunter Sharp and Khalif Raymond. The only reason I note these guys is because the return game in the first part of the year in 2018 wasn't really that good. Uh, Andrew Adams, Darian Thompson, obviously replaced for Curtis Riley. John Jerry, the veteran guard, was cut. Uh, he was a starter for the past three to four seasons. And Ryan Connolly in 2020, uh, I just misread that, but then again, I'll go back to it. So um, going back to the trades, traded Eli Apple for a fourth round pick that we ended up trading up for Baker. And we drafted TJ Brunson with the seventh round pick they sent us. Um, my thoughts on that. No clear winner that trade because he did play with the playoff team, but then I think it was a year or two later, he was with the Panthers and now he's cut from there. And I think he's a free agent now or one with one of the teams. Um, and, you know, the fourth round pick obviously went to trading up for Baker, which didn't work out. Uh, Damon Harrison was the other one, traded Harrison for a fifth round pick and traded that one to Seattle for the Baker pick. So it kind of seems like we didn't win, but we didn't lose that trade either. Yes. Um, sorry. That was just like a lot of info in a row. Um, yeah. So two things I wanted to talk about were, again, just to reinforce my statements about BJ, BJ Hill when we're talking about the Jason Pierre-Paul trade. Yes, I understand Jason Pierre-Paul. He gets pressure on the quarterback. But again, like you said, that's a salary dump. We needed to get get rid of some money um, as well as it could be a Leonard Williams type situation. You know, I mean, this time last year, everyone was saying the Leonard Williams trade was awful. We gave up two, two valuable mid round picks for a guy who wasn't performing. Right. But then he came in this year and he played well when he was given the opportunity with the right system. I think the same thing goes for BJ Hill. Uh, people are going to say, obviously BJ Hill is not as good as Jason Pierre Paul, but like I said, we're likely to lose one of our big three on the defensive line. BJ Hill, I, I predict he's going to step in and, and he's going to show up to play right away. So that's my thoughts on the Jason Pierre-Paul trade. Not the best, not the worst. Um, and then as far as – I don't even remember what was the other thing you, you Eli said. Eli Apple and Damon Harrison. There. Right. I mean, uh, Damon Harrison, I, again, you have to treat that as more of a – Salary that was dump. Mi mi middle of the year, salary dump. It's good for us. We, we It's good for you, Damon. You know – they, they wanted to get him out of there. Again, they traded him to Detroit, a team with a similar situation. But at the time, Detroit was looking like uh, they, I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they were still in the playoff race. And uh, it was more of a respect move. You know, Giants fans loved Snacks. Snacks loved the Giants. He, he's, he's like definitely a fan favorite. They wanted to do him. You know, the Giants are a classy organization. I'm sure they wanted to give him an opportunity elsewhere. It was good for them. Good for us. That, with that... that a lot of um, a lot of people won't think about it this way, but what happened with that trade was they gave BJ Hill more time, and that's where you saw BJ Hill's production go up. I'm pretty sure exactly. before the trade he had one or two sacks. One I think was actually on Deshaun Watson, but you had that big game. Well, BJ Hill actually BJ Hill got more playing time, but that yeah. was where Dalvin Tomlinson started to shine because he took over that nose tackle. You mm -hmm. know, like yeah, he wasn't man, he wasn't like anchor. it was in the four three. Right. You know, I mean, even though that he came out of there uh, meeting Alabama fitting that um, and he did have a good rookie season in 2018. He statistically didn't have a great season because he didn't get any sacks, you know, a lot of pressures. But in terms of B.J. Hill, he had that big game against the Chicago Bears. And that's where we all saw his potential. And from then on, obviously, we thought that and obviously 2019 didn't really um, mm -hmm. we didn't really, you know, think that bj hill was what he was in 2018 but to sort of wrap up the 2018 season obviously we went five and eleven um which was two wins more than the years prior but obviously we took a late start to the rebuild uh some notes they hired Shermer, and we know this now to save eli's career to save eli's career yeah so i have opinions on the on the whole Shermer thing and and i have a big theory if you want to let me go I got a big theory of how 
things trickle down from the top to the bottom and why certain things happen and how a certain decision like keeping Eli Manning for extra years can lead to the Giants signing a bunch of Arizona Cardinals washed up kind of shitty role players, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So in my opinion, the whole thing of why Dave Gettleman only starts to progress now and now everyone kind of starts to see like, oh, he does kind of, he kind of is a visionary is because the Maras are family who are very loyal and very classy. And you're not going to get rid of Eli Manning unless it's on his terms. And you know what? They probably were, they especially after what happened, they're probably right for it. You know, the guy came in, doesn't even matter if he was led by two defenses. He won two Super Bowls for you. He's a Walter Payton man of the year. He's a class act. And he's a, he's a, once a giant, always a giant, only a giant. You know, he, he's that type of guy. Not, not to get corny and quote him, but, you know, the Giants are rightfully so. Did it kind of come back to bite us in the ass and stunt our growth maybe three to five years? Yes, probably. But, you know, that's why they brought in Pat Shermer because if you look at what Pat Shermer did in Minnesota, what was so uh, special as the offensive coordinator there is he kind of – he made an offense with these weapons, right, a Minnesota team that had weapons – like Thielen and Diggs and, and Dalvin Cook and whatnot. But they really didn't have a great quarterback. They had an older Case Keenum who wasn't so mobile. His completion percentage was very low in the years prior. And, you know, Pat Shermer comes in and with his system, with this play action, quick pass, dump off, you know, bootleg, everything that he kind of ran, West Coast style, Case Keenum jumps up to what I think it was like 66% completion percentage. Sorry, I don't have notes in front of me. But – that's a crazy number to jump to. And they go all the way, they march down all the way to the NFC championship game. So that was like a kind of a no brainer. I mean, the guys in the market for a head coaching job, you have Eli, you have these weapons like Odell, Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, all these guys, you gotta, you gotta bring in a guy if you're committed to keeping Eli until he's ready to go. So what happens there though, is that Pat Shermer does not know his ass from his elbow when you're talking about defense not to make it sound so like, mm-hmm. I don't know, bold, but that's pretty true. He's an offensive mind. He doesn't really, he didn't, we, we saw, he did not really have much to do with the defense. That was James Betcher's team. But again, it has to do with identity. Joe Judge has that identity. He knew who he wanted to bring in. He brought in Patrick Graham. He made the right moves. Pat Shermer, they, they hired James Betcher. He brings in all these Arizona Cardinals. It just didn't work. And I think that that all stems from the Maras wanting to keep Eli on board. Now they have a special teams coach, a neutral guy who's all about influencing the players and building an identity. And that's, that's why the Giants are starting to turn in the right direction. That's why Gettleman's still here. Because if the Giants didn't do that this year and they kept Shermer on board, they'd, they'd both be fired two weeks ago. I think the problem, and you are right with the, you know, Shermer not knowing his ass from his elbow on the defensive side. That's a problem with a lot of coordinators in the modern day football. Adam Gase, uh, you know, they were brought him in. Oh, he can, you know, fix Sam Darnold. He, you know, that stuff. Uh, another one is Matt Nagy. Another one, I don't know. There's a couple of options around the league where you could actually say that. Um, Anthony Lynn was thought to be one of them. A lot of these coordinators, and it's, I see where, organizations come from with this they see their quarterback genius Shermer being one of them they cannot coach a football team in its entirety not special teams not defense that's the problem with what happened with Pat Shermer he hired a guy almost had nothing to do with the defense I mean it's true also how many offensive how many offensive minded coaches do you know that are winning multiple Super Bowls if Belich- the, Belichick's a defensive coordinator. If the organization brings in an offensive guy to help their quarterback, I have not really seen success from that quarterback. People saying, oh, Matt Nagy, Matt, the defense. The defense actually did better than the offense 2018, 2019, 2020. You know, we're not seeing, you know, stats out of Mitch Trubisky. Sam Darnold took a fall from Gase's off- offensive system. Um, I mean, Carson Wentz the last two years under Peterson. Jimmy not much Garoppolo doesn't. Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo. Garoppolo. Too good. Defense. Jimmy. Robert Sala. So I, it's. I, it just doesn't. It, people people got to remember that defense wins championships. Yeah. And what 
organizations have to remember, and I agree with you there, but what organizations have to remember, it's what they do as a coordinator might not actually go into what they do as a coach. Because again, it's not just, no, you're creating an offense, you're calling plays. And a lot of these coaches like Shermer, they call plays. They don't just sit back and manage the whole game. They call plays. Adam Gase did it for a while. Um, Nagy did it for a while until he handed off to Bill Lazor. So they're not necessarily in charge of the defense. They're letting the defense handle the defense, which also is a bad thing. If you don't have talent on that side of the ball, the coaching. And it also kind of seems like, like these types of coaches, these offensive minded guys like Shermer, they don't really, it seems like they're just very, very, very focused on like, their system and keeping their system working not really like not just the defense and the special teams but also like controlling your players having a good relationship having a good grasp over the locker room everything like that so you know it's just I I don't I don't see it and and that that proves to be right everything with Pat Shermer he could not control that locker room he he lost them and it almost seems like 2019 was just a transitional year for the Giants you know they kept him along just because it was Eli's going out Daniel's coming in he's still an offensive minded guy let's let's help the kid learn to not make certain mistakes i guess i don't know but Shermer to me he was gone after that first year and i think the Giants made that move obviously because of Eli but I think that's the closest they would have got to Shermer because he won AP assistant NFL coach of the year. Cause obviously of what he did with the Vikings, that was the closest they were going to get. They were not going to get him as a coordinator. Hell, they didn't even get Stefanski as a coordinator. And he was, I think the quarterback's coach. So, you know, that just, again, throws it in your mind. Some coaches are just coordinators. Freddie kitchens could probably be another example of that. Um, another thing I bring up obviously deals with talent. Should have kept some of the guys in free agency and should have drafted somebody else with that Kyle Oletta pick. Because, you know, what are you doing with just a developmental pick? That's like picking James Morgan. I mean, the guy was never going to pan out. Um, It wasn't like you're taking Josh Allen or somebody else and then sitting them for a year. No, Kyle Oletta was not going to work out. I mean, he was 0 for 5 in the game he did play in, uh, which was actually against Washington. And he actually threw an interception. But again, he was not NFL ready. They just threw him out there because it was 40 to nothing. Um, one thing that Giants fans actually miss on 2018 is that we got a steal in Nick Gates. He was IR for most of the preseason, or at least at the end of the preseason. In 2019, he came back to play left tackle, left guard, what have you, makes it onto the active roster. And then, obviously, we know him now as the starting center. Center of the future. Center of the future. So Yeah, I like Nick, even though he's not, he's not the greatest – He's good. He's, he he's good. Job. Starts 16 he was, games. He was he's surprisingly nasty. very good. He was surprisingly very good this season. I don't think he allowed a sack all season, did he? No. Yeah, he, he didn't. And you know what? He's that nasty guy on, on the line. You know, he's that he's that mean bully. If anyone touches his teammates, he's up in their face, spitting. Aaron Donald. Ready to throw. Ready to throw. Exactly. So, you know, you, you like to have that, especially on a Joe Judge mentality team. Definitely. No, I like to know that if anyone knocks down Daniel Jones, Nick Nick Gates is coming. Yeah, uh, they should be scared. Just like the last game too with uh, Jalen Smith. I mean, what are you mm-hmm. doing? That whole first half with the way the Cowboys were playing. I mean, three personal foul penalties. They would they didn't they didn't look like they would want wanted to win that game. But nonetheless, let's transition to 2019. I don't think I'm missing anything from 2018. Let's go to uh, free agency or at least the start of it. We let go Landon Collins. We did not sign him back. A lot of the reason was that he may have not fit the scheme. A lot of the reason was that the Giants were not going to give him the money. Everyone was pissed off at the time. I bought or at least got for Christmas a Landon Collins jersey in December, ends up signing with the Washington now football team in March. And uh, that year did not instill, you know, Collins wanted to come back. And he blames Dave Gettleman 100% for that. Was it a good move? Yes, it was in the long term. Everyone was not in favor of that move at first, but look at the long term. Jabril Peppers improved this year in that Odell Beckham trade, which we're actually going to talk about next. You know, um, he wanted high paying money. I think he's eighty four million on a six year contract, if I'm not mistaken. And you know, Giants got a third round comp pick for him. So 
I think that's a good move by Gettleman, one of the more underrated moves. Uh, let's go to the infamous Odell Beckham trade that I actually like a lot. Didn't like it at the time. Love it. But no, I said I love it. right now. Always, always you know, have loved it. Um, what people – miss actually it's a minor error but who cares is that it was actually turned into one trade olivier vernon and odell beckham for the 17th overall pick on dexter lawrence jabril peppers kevin zeitler and o'shane Zimenez. even if I mean, o'shane Zimenez does not you know to be it's, come to be it's still a win it's still a win to me exactly still a win. odell he tore his acl this year he's going to rehab with saquon barkley but you know you, you, you lost two. You lost two high money, injury prone guys. One of which was a, literally a cancer to the locker room. Could not get along with a coach. Could not get along with a quarterback. Was only about himself. Says he's all about winning, but if you're all about yourself, it's a team sport. How are you going to win? So to me, that's a great, great trade. Dexter Lawrence has helped to make the defense what it is. I mean, Kevin Zeitler has been great. The, the, all these young guards are learning from him. I mean, it's a great trade, in my opinion. Jabril Peppers is, is a fan favorite. I really don't know what – I mean, obviously, they're OBJ fans. Now they're not necessarily Giant fans. But, again, Olivier Vernon could not stay on the field for his money and for the, you know, the money that was thrown at him. Uh, OBJ, you know, cancer in the locker room. And then, as I said before, even if O'Shane Zimenez doesn't pan out because he did end the season on a season-ending injury, I think it was something with his knee or surgery, something like that, you still got three good players in Lawrence Peppers. And even if you get two good years out of Kevin Zeitler and end up cutting him this offseason, I still like that trade a lot. No, I like that trade a lot. And, you know, Kevin Zeitler, it, I like, yes, we should probably cut him just because we have these young bucks and they're all ready to go. We'll save a lot of money. But Kevin Zeitler, don't forget, he was the best player on our offensive line for at least a year. At mm-hmm. least a year, he was the best. And, you know, he's probably still one of the better players on our line. Yes, he's older now. Yes, we pay him a good amount of money. But Kevin Zeitler served us very well. Definitely. Daniel Jones has, would not have progressed. Listen, he's still – the jury's still out. He hasn't progressed fully. But he would not have gone to the point where he's at. At least Kevin yeah. Zeitler was not there. Um, 2019 free agency. And then I'll go into the draft picks and the infamous draft trade. Golden Tate. Now, I'm going to make my comment, obviously. I might further evaluate, but I might just get it out now. I think the Giants half-assed their rebuild in a way. Because if you take a look at what what they did in terms of rebuilding in 2018, um, they traded Snacks and Apple. Those are defensive players. What they did in 2019 wasn't necessarily rebuilding the offense, other than Darius Slayton, Daniel Jones. Um, They signed Golden Tate to a four-year, $37 million contract. That's not necessarily rebuilding, in my opinion, or at least the way I see it. Um, They signed Mike Remmers. I mean, stopgap, he was decent for the offensive line. But again, you didn't draft any O-linemen from what I could, you know, gather till the seventh round. And the seventh round pick wasn't even, you know, going to work out in the end. So I think the Giants really half-assed that. I think that's why you saw emergence of this defense before the offense could actually do anything. Um in terms of other free agent signings, Marcus Golden, one year, $3.28 million deal. Loved it. For the James Betcher side of things, loved it. But obviously in you know 2020, we traded him for a six-round pick, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. Um, Olsen Pierre, minor signing, another Arizona guy that didn't pan out, but uh, low-risk signing. Another one that I didn't like, Arizona pick, but we ended Again, up – Again, you're, 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 you're locked into that James Betcher defense with Pat Shermer, remember. So, yes, that's going to happen. None of those signings were that significant or none of them hurt us that bad, but none of them were good. Yeah. Uh, the Giants declined his option in 2020, Antoine Bethea. Could not cover the deep ball for anything, was a box safety. And I was, again, they started giving Julian Love more playing time towards the end of the year. It wasn't because of Bethea's play. It was because Jubal Peppers got injured. So, you know, Julian Love looked good at safety in 2019. That's another better project because they put him at safety. They tried him at safety earlier this year, didn't really play out. And then towards the end of 2020, they tried him at corner. He looked good against the Cowboys. We'll see where that goes, but they'll probably still end up drafting a corner um, in this draft. But as far as free agency goes, not much spending other than Golden Tate, uh, but still, you know, not really impressive. Um, But obviously they did draft a lot of picks. Uh, let's go to the draft picks. Well, let me find it over here. Uh, all right. So obviously Jones, Jones, 
jury's still out on him, but I'm going to say it and we I'll should, admit we it. We should leave it at that, honestly, because he could step up and be Josh Allen next year or he could, could be nowhere, you know? Yeah. He, could, he um, could be Josh Allen or he could be Josh Rosen. Yeah. People didn't look at the next pick's player value to be the player value at 17. Dexter Lawrence, nice pick. Defensive line. Ogmali's on like the other it. side of the football. Yeah. I like it. You surround him with Leonard Williams and Dalvin and, Tomlinson. And, you know, you, you can't go, in my opinion, you can't go wrong with these 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 high-profile, uh, great unit SEC guys on the defensive side of the ball. I don't agree with taking an SEC quarterback if it's a guy from if it's a guy from Clemson, obviously Trevor Lawrence this year. Set that aside. Usually, I don't like these big SEC school quarterbacks, but as far as the defense go, these they're great. These guys from from Alabama, LSU, Clemson, just because they 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 function at a level closest to the NFL, and at the same time, they know how to not be the star of the defense and work in a unit, you know, building blocks. That's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing with Dexter Lawrence. He, he came in right away. Very pro ready guy. He's been great. All right. So uh, next pick infamous DeAndre Baker trade. We got the 30th overall pick. We traded the 37th overall pick, which Seattle traded to Carolina to get offensive tackle Greg Little out of Ole Miss. Um, the Seattle Seattle also used a fourth round pick that we gave them to select cornerback Hugo Amati and also another fourth round pick to select Ben Burke And obviously that trade did not work out. Unfortunately, I mean, the charges were dropped, but at the same time, that was too much drama. It's a lose, lose situation because if you kept Baker, the New York media would totally destroy you and you'd look bad for giving him a chance. And then if you released him and he was not guilty, well, you supposedly should have waited that long. I mean, it's just a lose-lose situation. Unfortunately, he did break his femur, and he might be a part of a Super Bowl team, but he's not going to play on one because he has a broken femur. Um, right. So with the rest of the draft picks, uh, O'Shane Zimenez, I think the jury's still out on him because showed Agreed. a lot in his rookie year in limited snaps like Lorenzo Carter, but this year had less snaps, I think, or at least about as much well, as his – injuries. Injuries, yes, but I think they favored more Carter, in my opinion, at least from what I could see. And obviously, towards Plus the end of the year, he had the injury. Account, you have to take into account they added Kyler Fackrell as well. Yeah, Plays that took from side. a lot of the playing time. And obviously, they factored in Golden a little bit. But obviously, as you said, Zimmon is out for the season with the injury towards the latter part. Um, was supposed to come back, but obviously he had the surgery. Julian Love, I would say – jury's still out on him, my opinion, because he had a good rookie year at safety. Uh, Flash towards the end of this year when it came to uh, cornerback, but safety in the beginning of this year was not good. Yeah, uh, I agree uh, on Julian Love. Jury's still out, but he needs to either learn how to play a different position very well and very fast, or or it's not looking good for his future with the Giants, at least, just because – it doesn't look like he's playing safety anytime soon. We have three safeties ahead of him on the roster with McKinney, Peppers, and Ryan, who's extended now. And then you, you don't you don't think you're going to see much of him playing in the slot either because you drafted Darnay Holmes, and he looks like much more of a promising uh, prospect, and he'll be on a rookie contract for longer than Love is. So you have to hope that Julian Love can, like, maybe learn how to play outside corner man-to-man. I mean – I don't think he has the skill set, so I'm not sure about Julian Love. He looked like a lot more of a promising product uh, going into the season than coming out. A lot of people said he's too slow to play outside corner, but obviously that's for the Giants to find out. Uh, the next guy is unfortunate, Ryan Connolly. He had the uh, torn ACL four games into 2019. He showed some flashes with the more snaps he played, had two interceptions, um, but obviously – um, I don't know what the reason was. They never gave a specific reason, obviously, for cutting him. Ryan Connolly was cut at the end of the 2020 yeah. preseason. Um, I think, in my opinion, that it is sort of a bad move on the Giants' part. Well, listen, you know, the players yeah. schemes everything. Um, I get it. He was injured. He's coming back from a torn ACL. That's always tough. But your alternatives at the time were seventh-round pick. Downs. Yeah, and Devontae Downs, who Devontae Downs was a special teamer for the Vikings. I'm surprised they saw Listen, anything in him, to be honest. 
it, if you ask me, the whole the whole Ryan Connolly issue is is it's it's unfortunate, but it's not as bad as you think because the Giants really were not in a position to take risks this year. Yeah. Um, with guys like that, and remember, you're dealing with a global pandemic. The coaches, new coaching staff, they're not getting a great look at everyone. Ryan Connolly's coming off of a torn ACL. We don't know how good he looked. We don't know how healthy he looked. And, you know, he Devontae Downs might have shown a little bit more in the in the uh, training camp than Ryan Connolly just because of the injury and, you know, COVID and everything like that. I mean, I think it's an unfortunate issue, but I think that the Giants were okay with cutting him because – a, you only saw a little bit of him last year. You only saw a little bit of him going into this year, and he's a late round pick. So it's like, yes, he was a fan favorite because he had the flashy interceptions and he had very good numbers for only playing. I think it was like four to six games or something. But four he, games. It, he wasn't a he wasn't a guy that was like that bad to let go of. It, it, it was it, it wasn't because Devontae Downs was a better option. It was probably more just because they saw more. Yeah, and obviously the no preseason games probably plays into that. And obviously um, this also plays into another thing on the defense where Darnay Holmes, he got off to the year on a really bad start. Again, he's a rookie, but they probably would have saw more in preseason games of what his struggles were going to look like rather than seeing, oh, my God, he's the uh, starting corner, second starting corner. You know, he's flashing and everything like that. The next guy is Darius Slayton. Uh, in my opinion, jury's – kind of out on him but at the same time I think he could produce I think the Giants went to him or at least relied on him way too much this season and he didn't produce I think the jury was out on him going into the season people had high hopes I think that people just the Giants fans obviously are now realized Darius is a good one. receiver he's a good receiver he's a good player but his ceiling just happens to be Michael Gallup you know he's never going to be that number one guy He's a number two, number three on the outside. You'll hit him for a couple long balls when he slips and, and gets behind everyone here and there, but he's, he's clearly not a number one wide receiver. And, and you know what? That's, fi- that's fine. He's a, fifth, he's a fifth round pick. So, you know, you know, it's not like you're taking fine. a first round pick and he's like, oh, it's a bust. No, he's a fifth round pick. Giants. He's exceeding are lucky. expectations. Surely, yeah. surely ex- exceeding expectations. Yeah, definitely. He's a good player. With that, Darius, um, is, Darius is a good player. Yeah, it's just the Giants will probably have to stop relying on him. And as we said, or at least saw in the press conferences with Dave Gettleman and John Merrill, what did they really uh, put on the plate? They said, you know, we need a playmaker. So free agency, if we have any money, and wide receiver in the draft, you'll probably be looking in the draft most likely. But again, you know, one of the two options, you'll probably see the Giants look for one. Listen, you also, people, 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 you have to you have to understand our meaning of a playmaker may not be the same meaning of a playmaker in Dave Gettleman's mind or John be Kyle Pitts. Mind, you know, we're looking for the sexy guy. They're looking for, it, it could be Kyle Pitts. It could be Corey Davis. It could be Curtis Samuel. You never know who they're thinking about, you know, like, don't forget. We still have Saquon Barkley. He's coming back. The offense is still supposed to flow through him. If not, why the fuck did we draft him the second overall? So we still have him. We still have Evan Ingram. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they're saying, you know what, hey, we want to keep our defense going. We need a cornerback in the first round. Patrick Sertan fell to us. Let's take a wide receiver Best in the second possible. round. And you know, I, I could see I could see things like that happening. So don't get hung up on the Giants drafting a sexy receiver. Do we need a, a wide receiver one or or another wide receiver like to help Daniel Jones develop? One hundred percent. Does that mean necessarily that we're going to get Allen Robinson or Kenny Galladay? If not, then we're getting Jalen Waddle. No, don't don't have your mind set on that. It's not a fail of an offseason if that's what happens. Yeah, um, the next guy, obviously, six round pick. He was with the Jets the last time I saw or you know knew uh, Corey Ballantine. James Betcher tried putting him in the slot most of 2019. It didn't work. 2020, the first two games he started wasn't a pretty picture. Giants said, "Okay, we're done with you." Midway through the season, and cut him. Uh, that's a six-round pick, though. You're not going to say, "Oh, it's a bust." No, it's six-round pick, so it's not. Um, that's a that's a Curtis that's a Curtis Riley situation. It's Curtis exactly Curtis Riley situation. You're experimenting with a late-round guy or or someone who's not supposed to be there, and you're yeah. hoping that he can he can all of a sudden take on this new role. It didn't work, but you know what? It was worth a try. You know what? What else are six rounders? Uh, the next two guys, seventh round picks, Georgia Safo and Jay. Not much, didn't really play. Had a concussion the whole year, didn't play. Uh, Chris Slayton was put on the active roster, but not much for anything. Again, 
seventh round picks. You're not going to get second round value out of them. Uh, seventh, just seventh rounder and a loaded defensive line as well. Don't forget, BJ Hill can't even can't even earn himself playing time. Curtis, Ryan, yeah. uh, Chris Slayton's not he's not going to find himself. If, if you don't see impressive stuff out of him, you're not going to see him at all. I mean, that's right. just the way. If it you don't see very impressive stuff, yeah, yeah. Um, also to note, uh, going back to February of 2019, the Giants cut Connor Barwin 1.5 million. They saved with that, so that's just a minor note. Now, coming out of the preseason, they didn't really cut anybody like big or you know as much as like 2018 or a 2020 like Connolly. Um, but at the end of the preseason, they did trade starting linebacker B.J. Goodson to Green Bay. They swapped seventh round picks. Uh, not really losers that trade. I don't know. I think they probably drafted Carter Coughlin with the pick that they had seventh round. So I would say that the Giants won that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Coughlin did flash, but again, BJ Goodson is now a starter on the Browns. So the Packers obviously didn't like what they saw. And, you know, what happened was, is they, you know, didn't like what they saw. And now he's with the Browns. Um, the next trade is probably one of my favorite trades. Now, obviously, people say, oh, it's a bad business move. Leonard Williams traded the third-round pick, which is now Ashton Davis, and a fifth-round pick for 2021 to the Jets for Leonard Williams. Obviously, I didn't like it at first because, like, hey, you know, two and six or whatever, and you're trading for a guy that's going to be a free agent. And, you know, he didn't produce with the Jets, and he had – Half a sack, 2019, 2020, 11 and a half. And here's what I got to say to that uh, before I let you, because I know you probably harp on this, but the last couple of years, two to three, they didn't surround him. And now I'm not blaming uh, just the Jets. You know, Williams has to contribute as well on the defensive side of the ball, but they didn't surround him like they did at the first part of his career. Muhammad Wilkerson, Sheldon Richardson, those guys on the defensive line, they were surrounding him. So the play was obviously better. But as they got rid of those guys, Leonard Williams' play started to, you know, fall down. And that's where they traded him and said, you know what, you're a bust at uh, fifth overall value, and they traded him to us. I mean, I love Leonard Williams' trade. For sure, my favorite trade. I like it more than the OBJ trade. Um, the reason being is – because there's so many different levels to it. It's, it's, first of all, you have a, you have a young guy who's a, a, a past pro bowler. He's coming from the Jets. Like, yes, it's a third and a fifth round pick. Yes, he's a free agent. But I think that this trade that Get, Dave Gettleman made and the balls that he has, that he just not only was – he made the trade. Everyone criticized him. Williams sucked in 2019. And then you go and franchise tag him and say, no, we're keeping him. I like this trade. It's going to pan out it just gives me that feeling that that's what's going to happen with the giants overall, not just in that trade. It gives me the feeling that everyone's hating, the on him hating on him. Now he does not give two shits what anyone else is saying. There's a reason he has a job and all the analysts don't. And I just feel like it's going to pan out the same way. This offensive line he's building is going to turn out. All right. Daniel Jones is going to turn out. All right. I just, I just have a feeling that Dave Gettleman, he's one of those guys. He has a process. It's slow. You need to trust it. You need to let it pan out. That's exactly what happened with the Leonard Williams trade. Um, also, a quick note before we go into, like, towards the end of the 2019 season, um, here's who uh, Dave Gettleman acquired off waivers coming from uh, end of the preseason to midseason to end of the season. 2018, Spencer Pulley was good at center when uh, – what's his face – John Jalapio was injured out for the rest of the season. Then they put John Greco out of starting position. So Pauly was all right. Um, 2019, the game he played in wasn't really that good. But again, you know, it's not like, oh my God, you know, he's a great center. He's supposed to play good. No, he's an average center who came from the Chargers and their offensive line is not pretty good. Antonio Hamilton worked for about a year and a half, uh, was put into the starting corner position because of the lack of talent that the Giants had in 2019, but he was good special teams gunner. Uh, Nate Stupar in 2018, good special teamer. Cody Core, 2019, good special teamer. Uh, still with a team who could also be a cap cut. Caden Smith, another good one by Gettleman, 2019. I mean, towards the end of the season, he was probably one of Jones' favorite targets. Uh, David Mayo also – paid contribute to He's a nice player He's a nice yeah. player uh, mayo could also be a cap cut this season but again mayo did fill in most of the role for 
at least a good portion of the 2019 season where the linebackers were rotating in and out. Ty Davis, Ogletree, injuries, whatnot. Corey Coleman in 2018, good kick returner. I would have loved to see him come back, but obviously he's not coming back. And he also, I think, is suspended indefinitely uh, from the NFL. Back, back to the back to the David Mayo thing. It, it almost feels like another thing Gettleman is so, so good at is, yes, he has this process. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it, it'll probably work. But I think another one of the things that he's so great at is is adding in these these players who they're not part of the 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 picture, but they're part of the keep my keep the keep us afloat, keep us respectable, as well as helping other guys around develop. David Mayo, yes, he's going to be a cap cut. Kevin Seitler, yes, he he'll likely be a, a salary dump, but as well. But these guys, they came in, they did a solid job. They kept the team respectable and they helped other guys around them develop. So like, that's just another thing I have to commend Dave Gettleman for. He's very good at finding those types of players. So same, uh, same thing with Antoine Bethea, by the way, Jabril Peppers learned a lot from him, even though the Antoine Bethea wasn't good. Jabril Peppers learned a ton from him. So in terms of just ending the 2019 season and our evaluation, um, talented rookies, obviously DeAndre Baker didn't play that well. I mean, some of it is on him guaranteed, but a lot of, People looking back on it said, you know, James Betcher wasn't doing his job, that Baker's more of a press man corner, and he's not a zone guy. Corey Ballantine, he's more of an outside guy. Stop placing him in the slot. And a lot of times before Jenkins got cut, which actually, you know, now to bring it up, Jenkins got cut for an offensive tweet. Um, a lot of Giants fans complained that they didn't get anything for him, which is a point to make, but, you know, didn't necessarily, oh, my God, you know, hurt the Giants. I mean, towards the end of the season, they didn't have a number one corner, but at the same time, um, Jenkins, before he got cut, <laughs> Betcher would not let him trail the number one receiver. I'm pretty sure it was after the Mike Evans, you know, blow up. So that's another thing. And Landon Collins plays in that too, you know, Many people don't like Landon Collins, especially me right now, because I think he's a cheap player. I think he, you know, is Washington and, you know, tried getting back at get Dave Gettleman for cutting, uh, putting him in free agency. But again, another result of James Betcher sticking to his scheme and not letting anybody but Arizona guys in it. And, it, you know, part of that is that only one to two guys in that Betcher, you know, bringing guys over worked. Josh Morrow was okay. And Marcus Golden had 10 and a half sacks as a giant. Did he force pressure tremendously? No, but he was a number two pass rusher as on a number one, you know, trying to lift the pass rush. Ten sacks. If the Giants didn't have those ten sacks from Golden, they would probably be um, dead last. Dead last in sacks. And I think they were 25th or 23rd. Probably pressures also. Probably pressure, pressures, pressures also. as well. Um, and obviously as a – Put in my notes here. Can't blame all the coaching on Gettleman. It has to be Pat Shermer too. And that was obviously the first hire he made, but or at least took part in. So it's not totally Gettleman's fault, but Gettleman does receive some blame for it. But again, Shermer brung in guys that really didn't work out well. It was more of, oh, this guy fits the scheme. And unfortunately, you know, Pat Shermer was fired. But going into 2020, the Giants hired Joe Judge. And they hired Jason Garrett and Patrick Graham. So now we get into a brighter side of things, um, which was obviously the 2020 uh, hindsight into 2020 sort of things. Giants declined the option on Antoine Bethea releasing, I believe, like one or three million in cap space. Now you take a look at free agency. Blake Martinez, three years, $30 million. Absolute home run right now. James Bradbury, three years, $45 million. Absolute home run right now. Levine Toilolo, good for his value, might be a cap cut. Two years, $6.2 million. Kyler Fackrell, good for his value. Uh, one year, $4.6 million. Got a sack when he came back from IR. Logan Ryan, one year, $7.5 million. Later extending him because he played so well. And Cameron Fleming, I mean, he wasn't the greatest right tackle, but also $3.5 million. The Giants are probably going to put Matt Parrott at right tackle um, next year or do whatever. By the way, sorry, this is this probably should have been in there a while ago. I just remembered another terrible signing. But I know we're about to start talking about all the good things Gettleman's done. Obviously, we both kind of feel the same way about DG. The jury's still out, but we, we're optimi uh, cautiously optimistic with him. But uh, just another signing that just popped into my mind, which was awful, was I think he gave Jonathan Stewart two years, six mil, right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, that that was that was probably the worst. That was probably the worst signing, in my opinion, of the whole thing. 
a lot of people are different on it looking back on it now because like no one of the content creators i associate with he says that he liked the signing because he was mentoring saquon barkley um but at the same time i really didn't like it because you know he was supposed to i think every year that the giants in my opinion they tried to put a running back over wayne gallman they tried replace was, him every time it, it was also just so bad because if i'm if, if i'm if i'm not mistaken i think we had like 13 14 million cap or something left like enough to sign like someone like usable you know and you just give half of that to, to, to stewart. jonathan stewart like what? yeah that and was just terrible wait let's continue with 2020 though sure uh one thing let's i want to reflect on things. yeah i know but one thing i want to reflect on that now you bring it up giants you know in my opinion every year tried replacing gallman and gallman never backed down um, they replaced him with Stewart, and obviously Stewart went on IR. Gallman yeah. was the number two back. Then you move to 2019 where they had Rod Smith, goes on IR. Then obviously Gallman gets that concussion midseason. They put Javorius Allen in as the second running back. But Gallman it, it still impresses uh, no, Joe I, Judge I, and his staff. And, you know. I'd love to find a way to keep, to keep Wayne Gallman. See, it's the problem is he might be asking unlikely. for money. But, you know, it's, money it's, it's and unlikely. another starting position. Right. It's unlikely, but, but I'd love to keep him around because Saquon Barkley with the injuries is clearly not a four down, three, four down back guy. He's, yeah. He's a, and he's not good in pass protection. And second. Yeah, no, he's not. Um, going back to obviously what made the cap more expendable. Kareem Martin was cut $4.8 million saved. Alec Ogletree was cut $8.25 million saved. Now let's go to the draft class. And we say this every year, but I think I mean it this time. This is his best draft class. By far, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Andrew Thomas obviously struggled at the first part of the year. May have been due to the way Mark Colombo was co- coaching. He's, he's a future LT, for sure. He's a future left tackle. Yeah. Um, later in the season, he got better, I, as we saw. Did well against Miles Garrett. Gave up only one sack. Um, obviously did well against the Cowboys the second time as well compared to the first time. Xavier McKinney, obviously that game against the Cowboys was big for him when it came to development purposes because he got the interception and a couple tackles for a loss. Matt Parrott obviously struggled a little bit going into the latter part of the season. But again, I like his play and I like his – I'd say the same as I would for Andrew Thomas. Obviously, rookie season, spotty, two different coaches – He's the RT of the future. So, I mean, already you're talking a great draft class. You've got a, a, a promising young safety and two two young startable tackles for years Definitely. to come. Uh, so, Darnay Holmes at four, uh, fourth round, 110. A lot of people didn't like the trade because Tyler Bidish was still on the board. The Giants uh, picked him, uh, uh, meeting uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holmes. Um, the center out of, of Wisconsin, right? Yeah. Yeah. A, lot, the, a lot of people said that they feared him because of the fact that he was injury prone. Obviously, he got injured with the Cowboys a little bit, but uh, the point is there, the Giants selected Darnay Holmes. First couple yeah. uh, games this season, I think Cushionberry was there as well. I think Cushionberry Cushion was... Berry, I think, was selected in the second round or the third round or the fourth round, actually, by Denver. I don't no, know I know. Round. I know he was. I'm just – I'm not sure if he was available when Holmes was there. I'll look it up later. Keep going. Also, the uh, Temple guy. I don't know his name. Matt something. Matt Hennessy. That's his name. Matt um, Hennessy. Yeah, the guy at the Temple. Um, so, the Giants selected Holmes. Obviously, the latter part of the season, he played well. Missed a couple of games due to injury. Shane Lemieux um, struggled heavily if you look at the tape, but obviously growing pains for a fifth-round offensive guard. So I'll take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take, take it. it. I'll take it now rather than years in the future. I'd rather have, you know, that than him be good and then struggle or be average years in the future. So I'll take exactly. that. Exactly. Uh linebacker Cam Brown, 183 overall. Like the guy, special teams also contributes on defense a little bit. Carter Coughlin, we saw some flashes out of him this year. I really like the guy. TJ Brunson was inactive for most of the games, but when he was active, special teams. Chris Williamson was cut. I don't know what practice squad he's on now, but take Crowder. Um, stepped up, I think, for at least a seventh-round pick. Good player. Um, Giants were trying to move out of Devontae Downs a little bit, ease Crowder in there. I think he's good for seventh-round value. Definitely. He's a nice player. Yeah. Um, obviously, coming out of 2020, the preseason cut Connolly, but obviously, you know, Crowder was eased in there after they figured out that Devontae Downs isn't really the long-term guy. I don't know if they still have that in their head or if they had – don't have that in their head. I, I don't know if they have anyone in their head there. I mean, listen, everyone's talking about wide receiver first round, wide receiver first round. I, I 
if Micah Parsons is there and they don't they don't mind his off the field stuff, I could see him taking him as well. That that could be a very very nice pick. And but, if Joe uh, Judge actually like you know says hey you know leave that stuff off the field, meaning the character issues. So that's a, another reason I w- I don't want Juju as a giant. Is all right. the is all that stuff. Right. Um, what was I going to say? 2020 passes by Giants go six and 10. I mean, looking at the schedule, honestly, and now obviously in season, you'll say, Oh, we're supposed to win again. This against this team, against this team, against this team. But I believe that the Giants did not lose a game. They were supposed to win. In my opinion, looking at the schedule, because if you look at the 49ers, obviously in season, they were supposed to beat them because they were so depleted, but they were supposed to be a good team out of season before the season. And we lost to them, but we beat the Seahawks. We beat the Eagles, we beat the Cowboys, we beat Washington. You beat your rivals, then you move on to beating better teams. That's at least my analogy to that. And we went 6-10, and 10, which is my predicted record for this team. And I think they exceeded expectations heavily. Uh, the only issue I would have is obviously that corner two position. You know, you flopped around. It's because of the Baker thing, too. Uh, Ryan Lewis, Isaac Yadam, Corey Ballantine, all these guys. If Julian Love is that guy at corner two, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes... Yeah, but, you know, um, if that guy is the corner two or if someone else is the corner two, great. But obviously, you know, the cornerback two merry-go-round. Um, anything else you have to say to cap off the 2020 season? Um, no, I'm just that I'm excited for the 2021 season. It's it's do or die, win or cry for Dave Gettleman. Um, I'm a Jones. believer that he's going to get it done. I'm, Daniel Jones as well. Uh, Daniel Jones – Daniel Jones as well. He need, they need to get him a weapon, but uh, I, I think I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be all right. Hopefully, we get nine, ten wins next year with upgrade at Hopefully. different positions. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Jordan, thank you for coming on. Always a pleasure. All right, Thanks talk for to you. Me. Talk to you soon. That's episode number eighty-two of the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast.